Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She called us to live to a higher standard and not be satisfied with just shallow religion when we could have a relationship with God and give Him our best. Today our podcast is entitled Falling and Rising. This series continues in the coming weeks as we hear from family, friends, and others who are influenced by Elizabeth Elliot's life and message. And we continue right now our extended series into Jim Elliott's Operation Alka and other events during Elizabeth's time in Ecuador. Ah, the love story of Jim and Elizabeth. We'll hear about falling in love, about spiritual ups and downs. And we have a couple guests once again today to share some insights into what Elizabeth Elliott was like. Kathy Reek, president of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, has been a friend and supporter of Lars and Elizabeth for years. She'll share insights on uh, Elizabeth's latter years, about her influence with strangers, and how one special word about the death of Jim made an impact on Kathy. Also, Bob Schuster will be joining us. He's an archivist at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center Archives, and he's been doing that for decades, helping countless researchers learn from the past to understand the present. He'll be talking about Elizabeth and the topic of suffering. Right now, we hear about one of Elizabeth's first experiences with Jim. It was watching him wrestle. He was the India rubber man. What was that about? And what was his reason for wrestling? What did that have to do with not being waterlogged. Well, here it is, Gateway to Joy 103, Falling in Love. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot. I was telling you the story of Jim Elliot, a little bit about his background, and then when he went to college, some of the things which impressed me when I first got to know him. I think one of my first experiences of really watching him was when he was wrestling. My brother Dave had said, you've got to go and watch Jim Elliot wrestle. He was called the India Rubber Man because they used to tie him in knots, but they never managed to pin him, and he won a championship. But his reason for wrestling, as he wrote in his diary, was in order not to get waterlogged and flabby. He was doing what the Apostle Paul did, buffeting his body. They had prayer meetings in the house where he lived, followed by what he called consecrated bull sessions when they would discuss something from the scripture or something that had happened that day or perhaps something they'd heard in chapel. And then he said we would dive to our knees and tell God about it. When Jim was a sophomore, he wrote, What a brutish master sin is, taking the joy from one's life, stealing money and health, giving promise of tomorrow's pleasures, and finally leading one on to the rotten planking that overlies the mouth of the pit. It is with honest praise to God I can look up tonight and rejoice in his loving kindness in delivering me from a life of useless frustration and the ultimate agonies of the gnawing, undying worms of remorse and regret. It was sometime during his first two years in college that Jim became conscious of the direct and personal implications of Jesus' command to go and preach the gospel. There's no record of the exact time when his decision was made, but there's a small black loose-leaf notebook, his companion throughout his college days, which carries evidence of his concern for the millions who had not had the chance to hear what God had done to bring man to himself. This notebook was found on the Kurarai beach after Jim's death, its pages scattered along the sand, some washed clean of ink, others stained with mud and rain, but still legible. Besides the names of hundreds of people for whom Jim was praying, the notes contained a recipe for soap-making, doubtless jotted down in anticipation of pioneer life on some mission field, notes for his own sermons preached in English, Spanish, and Quechua, obviously notes made after he became a missionary, and some statistics about missions, for example, that there are 1,700 languages which have not a word of the Bible translated. That was back in the 40s. There have been a good many more unwritten languages discovered since then. 90% of the people who volunteer for the mission field never get there. It takes more than a Lord, I'm willing. 
64% of the world have never heard of Christ. There is one Christian worker for every 50,000 people in foreign lands, while there is one to every 500 in the United States. In view of the unequivocal command of Christ, coupled with these staggering facts, Jim believed that if he stayed in the United States, the burden of proof would lie with him to show that he was justified in staying. So he began to plan for the mission field, wherever God might lead, and he took one very practical step in that direction in the summer of 1947 when he hitchhiked to Mexico with a college friend, Ron Harris, whose parents were missionaries there. Well, toward the end of Jim's junior year, he found himself falling in love. Falling in love with a girl that he described as tall, gaunt, and far from beautiful. She was also a Greek major, and so they were in the same classes. I suppose I might as well admit right now that I was that tall, gaunt, far from beautiful girl. I had been madly in love with Jim for a whole lot longer than I cared to admit, but I knew that it was foolish. There was no chance whatsoever that Jim was ever going to look at me, I thought, and so I tried to submit my feelings for Jim to the Lord, constantly doing my best to keep my eyes off him and to pretend that I didn't even notice when he came into the classroom. But I began noticing him more and more. In fact, I even thought that I noticed that there were times when he sort of went out of his way to get the seat next to mine. Don't be a fool, I told myself. Jim Elliott is a BTO, a big-time operator. He's not going to notice a TWO, a teeny-weeny operator, which was one of the ways in which we categorized the students on the campus. Jim was a campus clown. He was a campus spiritual leader, president of the Foreign Missions Fellowship. He was a wrestler. He was a straight-A student, and I need not get my hopes up. But then toward the end of his junior year and the end of my senior year, we began studying together. He would find me at a certain place where I used to study outside the library in what was Blanchard Hall, and we were studying Thucydides, Herodotus, and the Septuagint. There were times when Jim would come along with his Thucydides book and his dictionary, and we would sit down and go through the translation together. I have to confess that there were times when I felt as if I was doing most of the work and Jim was just sitting there looking at me, but then I tried to tell myself that that was only my imagination. Jim had actually asked me for a date in October of my senior year. I was thrilled. I was amazed because Jim never dated anybody. They thought he was a woman hater. And I accepted the date, but then I broke it. I was told by the other girls in the dormitory that I had to be out of my mind. Don't you know that Jim Elliott is a real catch? He never dates anybody. He must really be interested in you. The reason I had broken it was because there was going to be a Bible study that same night that I really wanted to attend. So when I told Jim my reason for breaking it, he said, well, fine. He said, we'll go to the Bible study together. No, I said, I really think that would be a little distracting. Why don't we just go separately? So that's what we did. Jim had been going through a spiritual struggle over the whole matter of sexual hunger. He was not a woman hater, not by a long shot. In fact, he had gone almost steady with a girl for three out of his four years of high school. He liked her very much. He spent what he thought was far too much time and money on her and decided that he would keep clear of women when he went to college in order to get both a B.A. and an A.U.G., an approved unto God degree. He was studying Matthew 19, 12, in which Jesus speaks about eunuchs, people who have either been born eunuchs, have made themselves eunuchs, or have become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. Hmm, Jim thought, I wonder if maybe I'm supposed to become a eunuch for the kingdom of God. Surrender my sexual hunger, my desire for marriage, totally to God, and stay single. Then he read 1 Corinthians 7. Paul speaks there of the gift of singleness. 
It's a gift. Paul wished that everybody had the gift of singleness. Then Jim found out that his father was praying that his son Jim would be another Apostle Paul, that he would stay single. His father had two other sons, two older sons, both of whom had married. His last hope was Jim. Would he have one son who would follow the example of the Apostle Paul and remain single? Jim wrote in his diary, I shall covet no inheritance, nothing but Christ. My brother Dave invited Jim to come to our house in Moorestown, New Jersey, for Christmas. This is what he wrote to his family from my home. What God's way is in bringing me here, I cannot now say, nor perhaps ever can, while the ticking of clocks assails the ear. But that he is leading, and that his purpose shall not fail, I know without doubt. Here I am in the midst of a fine family, a fellow Bob's age and his wife, Phil and Margaret, Betty, who is 21 today and a senior at Wheaton, is next followed by Brother Dave. Below him are Ginny, a Bobby Soxer of 15 who closes her eyes like Jane when she grins, which she does much, and Tommy, 13, with Jimmy, 7, who combine to keep the rest of us in fine spirits and good humor. Again, I find God's people very good, and these particularly godly. My family was enchanted with Jim, as staid Easterners of Philadelphia and New England stock, we found his sudden wide smile and strong hand clasp, his complete ingenuousness, refreshing. He fixed everything that needed fixing around the aging place that had been home for eight of us for a number of years. He wiped dishes for a little old lady who was then a kitchen helper for my mother. That young man, said Mrs. Kershaw, will go places. When he finds a fork that I haven't washed properly... He washes it himself instead of putting it back in the dishpan for me to do. Jim began keeping a journal in 1948, the same year that I began, when toward the end of that year Jim confessed his love for me. We compared notes. We found that God had been taking us through the same spiritual exercises, the same struggles in submitting our hunger for the opposite sex totally to him. Jim prayed that God would take this love of his. He used the words of Francis Ridley Havergal's hymn, Take my love, my God, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. And he gave to me a little hymn book in which he had marked hymn number 46, Have I an object, Lord, below, which would divide my heart with thee? I began to think that Jim was truly in love with me and that it was a very dangerous state for us to be in. What if we should deflect one another from the will of God? Gateway to Joy 103, Falling in Love. You know, one of the things we want to do here at the podcast is to help you understand better what Elizabeth was like and how she influenced people. Kathy Rigg, the president of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, one word especially about Jim's death made an impression on Kathy. Here's Kathy Reeg. Elizabeth and Lars were at our home, and they would come and stay with us. And she was deep in the throes of dementia by that, that time. And she was wheelchair-bound, and she didn't speak. And so she couldn't verbalize or really communicate. And so as sad as it, it would be, seem to someone thinking about that if you were never around her in that state the holy spirit was just right there i mean when she went into a room it's just the presence of the holy spirit just lit up the room because when he indwells in us it's forever i mean it's forever and so that was that was really precious i could we could take her places and just be walking you know, through a garden when we lived in Charleston and um, somebody would say, no, is that your mother? And I'd say, no, no, this is, this is Elizabeth Elliot. And I, I mean, I would have people actually burst into tears and drop to a knee as I was wheeling her in her wheelchair and go, you know, I'm from England and I can't even begin to tell you what an impression that your, your life and your books have made and your speaking have made on my life. 
I mean, that happened over and over and over again. And of course, she couldn't communicate that back to them or anything. But there was one evening we were at our home and Elizabeth and I were sitting by the fire and I was sitting at her feet. And in the next room, adjoining room, Lars and the caregivers, my husband, were listening to Beyond Gates of Splendor. And that's the documentary that revisited the whole encounter uh, that the missionaries' wives had during that time and their husband's death. We could hear, you know, what was going on. But when Elizabeth was sitting there at the very moment that they came to the part that everyone realized that the men had all been killed, she raised her hand and in a hat, just kind of made a half circle motion. And she just said, everyone, just that's all she said. She just went, everyone. And it would be the only time I, I, I would ever hear her speak an intelligible word. But she knew exactly what was going on on that documentary. And she was just telling me that everyone had died. She passed away um, then probably about six months later. Kathy Rigg, president of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation and friend of Lars Gren and Elizabeth Elliott Gren. Well, before we get to Bob Schuster's comments about Elizabeth Elliot and the topic of suffering, we have Gateway to Joy 104, Spiritual Ups and Downs. Well, they talked for about seven hours. Jim talked about the gift of singleness. He wanted to be a missionary like Paul. Were they going to be willing to turn their relationship over to God? I left off in my last talk telling you about how Jim Elliott had fallen in love with me. For months, he had kept it to himself, finally confessed it to me. He said, I think we need to get squared away how we feel about each other. How we feel about each other, I thought, well, what a nerve he has to imagine that I have some feelings for him. But of course, I was thrilled. And as we sat and compared notes, we sat on the grass of a park, talked for about seven hours, Jim told me how he had been struggling against this business of falling in love because he was hoping that perhaps God was going to give him the gift of singleness and he would be a missionary after the manner of St. Paul. We took a walk one evening after that day in the park discussing what had seemed to us a strange path in which God was leading us. We had dated only once, a missionary meeting in Chicago a month before. We had spent some time in study and conversation, but neither of us had acknowledged anything beyond a worthwhile friendship. Now we were facing the simple truth. We loved each other. We wandered into a cemetery without really much thinking, sat down on a stone slab, and Jim told me that he had committed me to God, much as Abraham had done his son Isaac. This came almost as a shock to me, for it was exactly the figure which had been in my mind for several days as I had been thinking about our relationship. We agreed that God was certainly directing us, our lives belonged to Him, there was no question about that, and if He should choose to accept the sacrifice, that sacrifice which we had made of our love life to Him, and to consume it, we were determined that we would not lay a hand on it to retrieve it for ourselves. There was nothing more to be said. We sat in silence, and suddenly we were aware that the moon had risen behind us and was casting the shadow of a great stone cross between us. The date of that night is marked in Jim's hymn book beside these lines. If thou shouldst call me to resign what most I prize, it ne'er was mine. I only yield thee what was thine. Thy will be done. I graduated just a few weeks after this experience. As far as we knew then, we were not going to see each other again. I lived in New Jersey. Jim lived in Oregon. I thought I was going to Africa. Jim was definitely going to Latin America. We had turned our love over to God and expected God to take care of it. Jim wrote in his journal, Joshua 5 and 6 speaks of devoted things. Here is something for my soul as regards Betty. 
As far as we are both concerned, she was devoted, not to destruction as was Jericho, but to God as a burnt offering. Fix my heart, holy Lord, to follow thee, in no detail to touch what is not mine. The cross is final. He went on a gospel team that summer. My brother Dave was a member of that team. And in July of 1948, he wrote this in his journal. He makes his ministers a flame of fire. Am I ignitable? God deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of the Spirit that I may be a flame. But flame is transient, often short-lived. Canst thou bear this, my soul, short life? And then he wrote later on, have had much struggle of soul lately, doubts as to the truth of God's care for the world, springing, I think, from so little evidence of his power in the gospel. He was still on the gospel team, and they were not seeing the kind of dramatic results that young college men would hope to see. They were gifted men. They were all out for God. They had gone on this trip for no other reason but obedience to him, Surely the Lord was going to let them see dramatic conversions, people streaming forward. It didn't happen. So he wrote in his journal, comforted mightily yesterday morning by realizing that the rest of faith is upon fact, and that especially in the resurrection of Christ. In other words, Jim was beginning to realize that if our faith rests on things which we hope God is going to do for us, temporally, things in this world. That kind of faith is bound to be shaken. The rest of faith is upon fact, primarily the fact of the resurrection of Christ. This was Jim's prayer. Father, make of me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ in me. All during this summer, when Jim was traveling with the gospel team, I was studying linguistics at the University of Oklahoma. I was going through some real struggles of soul over the fact that it looked very much to me as though I was going to be single for the rest of my life. I didn't really want to be single. I wasn't happy with that prospect. I had been trying to learn to sing all those great hymns that express such exalted spiritual thoughts, such as Beneath the Cross of Jesus, which has a stanza that says, I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Could I honestly say that? I was afraid I couldn't. Jim was having his spiritual ups and downs, and I certainly was having mine. At the end of that summer, I believed that God was leading me to go to Bible school in Alberta, Canada. My itinerary took me straight through Wheaton, where Jim was, and we saw each other once again. Jim told me he was glad that I had come, and he wanted me to read his journals. Not in order that I might be impressed with his spirituality, but that I might see how many spiritual ups and downs there were, how inconsistent he was, how far from being what I really thought he was. There were many things in there that he did not think were very admirable, and he thought, you might as well see them, you might as well read the truth. And so when he gave me this journal, he said, it is not written as a diary of my experiences or feelings, but more as a book of remembrance, to enable me to ask definitely by forcing myself to put yearnings into words. This I have failed miserably to do, but I don't apologize now. All I have asked has not been given, and the Father's withholding has served only to intensify my desires. He knows that the hungrier one is, the more appreciative he becomes of food. And if I have gotten nothing else from this year's experience, he has given me a hunger for himself I never experienced before. He only promises water to the thirsty, satiation to the unsatisfied, I do not say dissatisfied, filling to those famished for righteousness. 
So he has, by his concealing of himself, given me longings that can only be slaked when Psalm 17, 15 is realized. Betty, we shall behold him face to face, much as you and I have looked with longing on one another. And he will tell us of his love in those looks, as we have never known it here. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. He knows our love and is touched from a sympathy within. And I feel he holds us from each other, that he might draw us to himself. Let's pray individually, draw me. And it may be that then we will be allowed to say together, we will run after thee. And he quoted Isaiah 8:17, And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. And also Second Chronicles 20, verse 12, Our eyes are upon thee. Jim had not told his parents very much about me, but he wrote to them on September 26th, I have just come in from a long talk with Betty Howard. I don't know what I have written of her, nor what impressions I have given, but somehow... She is deliciously satisfying company, and this, strangely enough, is not on account of a fine-featured face, a shapely form, nor even on account of rare conversational powers. Of the former two, she possesses little of appeal. Of the latter, though she has decided gifts of expression, she does not at all strike one as startling. This is what amazes me, for objectively she has practically nothing that would center my interests. We find, however, that our thought patterns coincide in a myriad of ways. There is a thought bond that I have known with few others and a huge thirst for God that may surpass my own in many respects. I can hear Ruby, that was Jim's sister-in-law, laughing. But the Lord led us both to feel last spring that we were to go through life unmarried. She from Isaiah 54, which says, Thy maker is thine husband, I from Matthew 19:12, the part about eunuchs, and 1 Corinthians 7, which speaks of singleness as a gift. She is not playing a game. I have said begone to this feeling often, and even now wish it did not obscure my thinking. But it persists not as something cumbersome, a weight, but more as soul pressure, almost as a prayer burden persists, only in my emotions more distinctly. She leaves Tuesday, for which I'm thankful, as I must think clearly if I'm to understand Hebrew and Greek. The Lord knows how I surrendered this love life business to him long ago, and the assurance that he will eventually lead us into his way is strong tonight. If you ever prayed for Jim, redouble your earnestness. I seek his will alone. Enough for now. All questions will be answered as honestly as a hypocrite of my experience can answer them. Gateway to Joy 104, Spiritual Ups and Downs. Bob Schuster has been an archivist for decades with the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center Archives, helping researchers learn from the past to understand the present. He has a a quick word about suffering helping us uh, with the podcast today to understand Elizabeth Elliot a little bit better. Of course, she went through a great many changes and a great deal of suffering in her life, often reflected in her letters. I was struck how she struggled with this, the way that Job struggled with uh, his suffering, and uh, we can think of other characters, but these struggles bringing her closer to God and bringing her wisdom, that wisdom and deeper faith that came from these struggles. Archivist Bob Schuster. Well, on behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources available at elizabethelliot.org. And thank you for being a part of the podcast today. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are those everlasting arms.